Nassim, thank you so much for joining us here at thank Risk you. Minds. I'm honored to be here. I don't know if you know, but the first time I lectured at Risk Minds was in 1998. Wow, so this is it your 20th 20 years anniversary. Ago. 1998, 99, I don't remember, but you know, it's close enough, plus or minus 5%. An awful lot has years. changed since then. Not my, is it, I mean, of course, this is much bigger, more sophisticated. The world did change a bit, <laughs> but I'm honored to be here. Good. And I love coming back. So 20 years after your first appearance here, yes. what would you say are the greatest risks facing this industry now? I mean, the fact is uh, we have two, two, two classes of problem. Let me talk about the uh, more economic uh, uh, risk, and then I'll talk about the structural risk that we have. The economic risk is quite acute that we have much more debt than we did 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, you know, we had a crisis. So the, the same, it's like we cured the crisis, a debt crisis was debt. So we have accumulation of debt and that's not very good. Uh, we also have an increase in moral hazard in the system. In other words, people gaming the system. Uh, more and more people are gaming the system. So. Uh, we have to worry about it, but visibly uh, many people are uh, concerned and this is why they go to risk conferences. That's the first level. The second one, something I addressed in Skin in the Game, is that people are still unable to uh, uh, realize that uh, there should be no risk management. You should study risk taking, not risk management, because you cannot separate uh, the income generating technique from the risks associated with it. They're not separable. It's the same, it's a decision making. And they all should be in a class of decision making on uncertainty. So you should attract more risk takers. And in fact, I see some risk takers, but I'm saying that you have to worry about an industry that's dominated by non risk takers discussing risks and separating the function from that of risk taking. Do you think that risk taking would be facilitated more with the proliferation now of data and tech? Do you think that will help with that? Uh, not, not, not really. I think, uh, uh, and, and tomorrow I'll discuss it a little bit in my lecture. Uh, big data brings more risks than it solves. Uh, in, in principle, more data, the more knowledge we acquire, the more understanding we get. But in fact, with data comes a lot of noise. So people tend to drown in noise and, and have a lot of blind alleys, you know, and, and, and without knowing the blind alleys. So there's a nice balance between uh, technical knowledge and data, that, and, and that balance has been disrupted by too much data, but uh, technical understanding has not grown. Tomorrow my lecture will be on how our grandmothers understand risks a lot better than so-called risk professionals. And you don't but think something like machine learning and AI will help with that and will catch up? Machine learning will help you identify the profile of people capable of, um, you know, uh, cheating on their tax return or uh, stuff like that. Machine learning cannot capture things in the class of risks I call fat tails. It will not, cannot. There's, uh, there's some, it's something like you cannot invent information. So you're really valuing human, the human factor and Some classes and experience. of human experience and uh, human wisdom. And also, uh, tomorrow I'll, I'll talk about paranoia. That we have a tendency, a natural tendency to be paranoid. And uh, we shouldn't tamper with it. And, and a lot of psychologists of risks are tampering with it, and not realizing that when you look at the problem and under richer assumptions from probability theory, in fact, your grandmother is correct and the psychologists of risk are wrong. So, if we are very risk averse now, yes, is that what yes. you're saying? How do we counter that and mitigate some, that? No, some, you should have a lot of paranoia about what I call ruin and be more risk taking in things that do not entail ruin. So, the class of things that have ruin in them worry. And in fact, a lot of people take ruin risks but not. Uh, regular risk to try to avoid, to have to have a smooth income while taking a lot of tail risk, what I call tail risk, rather than just have more volatility of income but less tail risk. So that's the, the key things you think are wrong. What would you say, so, the where did you say the opportunities lie and, and what are you optimistic about? The opportunities about? like, I, I'm, op uh, I'm optimistic, every time you have a, a crisis, the, you have a, a chance for people who know how to play with crises to make some money either with the crisis or coming out of the crisis. 
when other people are shell shocked because they lost money in the crisis. So people have this no notion that everybody should lose money at the same time. Well, it's not the case. There's a class of people. Uh, and, and you have to just learn how to handle a crisis ahead of time. You talked about grandmothers getting it right. What do yes. you mean by that and, and where okay. are they getting it right? Let me give you a sobering uh, statistic. Uh, more than 50% of psychology papers do not replicate. Okay? I'm sure that more than 99% of what your grandmother told you holds and will hold. So we need to learn from experience and value We learn from collective experience over time, dynamically, not from someone who just looked at a model, did some naive statistics and came up with a conclusion. So um, just moving to a slightly different topic, uh, with all of that in mind, we talked a bit about machine learning and, and yes, AI yes, earlier. Yes. How would you say global industrialization is changing the landscape because it's a slightly different industrialization to what it was in the mid-century but you know what are we looking at now in terms of what that can do okay you you, you uh, the the i've described the last crisis you know after it happened but also uh, quite a bit before it happened by explaining that the world has lost um, uh, its island uh, properties so you had isolated islands and when you have an island you have a lot more uh, biological diversity in an island than you do on a, in a continent. And there's, uh, some people call it square law because the larger the continent, the more species you're going to have, but the density will, de will decrease. So uh, uh, since then, uh, now the world is dominated by Facebook, uh, by a few names. And uh, so you see that, that for example, uh, if you're a soccer player, a football player, um, 100 years ago or 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you made uh, a good income. Uh, I mean, it was more distributed. Today, it's a winner-take-all effect. Now, that winner-take-all effect we're observing because of globalization uh, worldwide in economic life. It causes inequalities, it causes, but it also causes instability because the road to the top, say the road to becoming Facebook or Google or Apple at the time was short, the road back, you know, to the college dorm, whatever they started, to the garage, is also equally short. So this tells us that you're going to have more and more concentration, more unfairness, uh, but the system will calibrate itself by making the one at the top collapse so someone else can come to the top. If you tamper with it, you make people at the top become frozen in that position and that's not good for the system long run. So you would like to see more diversity and more players out there? No, I would like to, to have more, I mean this is, I can understand the, the, the fight, uh, the rise against globalism because people want to have their own little industries, their own little uh, industrial diversity uh, uh, preserved and globalists sort of don't get it. They don't get that it's nice to have a global world but with it comes concentration. So what do you want? Do you want concentration or do you want, you know, fairness? So they, they, they don't quite get it. But I think that uh, with time, people are realizing that <laughs> when you look at complexity models and apply them to the world, that some things taken for granted in economics, like economies of scale or uh, globalization, uh, they don't really hold. So what do you think now, just get looking forward, will be the key yeah. themes that we'll be talking about, perhaps at this conference in a year's time? What do you see 2019 holding? I, uh, I, I have no, I mean, I, I have no idea how to predict, but let me tell you, give you a rule. I have, uh, I call it the Lindy effect, is the way I write my books is I make sure you can read them today, they're interesting today. But if I want people to interest people 10 years from now, I write something that will, would have been relevant today and 10 years ago. You see, this is how you, you, you don't just add things. So I think that we'll be talking next year about what we're talking about today, jointly today, and we'll have been discussed, you know, would have discussed 10 years ago or 20 years ago, given that I'm a veteran of this. So the same themes will be keeping people awake next year that have kept people awake for the last 20 years at night? Yeah, we'll be talking about the same thing with some variation, but, but, but your bet is going to be talking about the same things. Thank you so much for sharing great. your insights. It's been great to talk to you. Thank you.